Hello, this is Taylor Elwood with the Indie Author Business Success Podcast. And today I'm really excited because I have with me T.L. Heinrich. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and, and your books and where we can find you on the web. Uh, okay. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. This is really exciting. Um, I, as Taylor said, my name is T.L. Heinrich. That's what I write uh, most of my superhero fiction under, but uh, in 2021, I'll also be publishing um, two series under my name, Trish Heinrich. Uh, so I have two pen names. Um, you can find my superhero books on Amazon, and you can also find them on the superhero-fiction.com website. Um, and I have them um, in ebook and print, and my first audiobook just came out a couple of weeks ago, so I'm super excited about that. Um, you can also find me at www.trishheinrich.com um, for all of my books and my newsletter and all that good stuff. Well, congratulations on the audiobook, Trish. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I was trying for almost two years to get it done. I went through two different narrators. Oh, I was wow. like, it's never going to happen. And it finally did. So. Well, you know, I, and, and that kind of brings us to our, our topic, which is, you know, the business of writing and how we make some of these decisions, because as authors, you know, we're going out there and we're, we're writing our passion, we're writing superhero fiction, which both you and I do, or, mm -hmm. or whatever else we're writing. And, um, you know, it's always kind of one of those cases of how do we make those business decisions mm -hmm. around like finding the right narrator or, or other things. And I, I've followed your journey quite a bit because I'm a fan of your fiction. So, you know, it's always interesting to watch when you see someone go through some transitions business-wise and you think, well, why did they make those decisions and what were they, what were they thinking and things like that? And of course, I mean, a lot of times when people think about the business of writing, they focus on, you know, someone like David Gogren or whoever who's, mm -hmm. you know, doing stuff. But I think it's important to also look at like, you know, maybe not someone who's writing about the business of writing, but somebody who's actively living it and making those yeah. decisions each day. And that's one of the reasons I wanted you on here as well as because of some of the things that you're doing around the superhero fiction um, stuff. So let's talk about, let's talk about the audiobook first. Why, why did you need to go through two narrators? What was the process <sighs> around that? <laughs> well, um, I don't have any upfront capital mm -hmm. and it's expensive to produce an audiobook, especially this first book um, is very, very long. And if I could do it all over again, I would actually, instead of having a trilogy, I'd probably have four books instead of three because this first one's just a monster. Um, it ended up being over 11 hours long. Wow. And so, yeah, to have upfront capital for that, it was impossible. So I had to go with the royalty share, which on ACX, which is the production arm of Audible, it does limit your choices. Um, the kind of narrator I wanted wasn't willing to do um, a royalty share unless I was willing to put up, you know, sometimes up to half up front. And I just didn't have that. So I chose the narrator that I thought, okay, she's really raw. She's, she doesn't really have a lot of credits but she's working with this kind of production group. So I assumed, which you should never do, that they had um, heavily vetted all of their narrators and that everything was gonna go great and that they were, they were gonna handle it very professionally. And at first it was fine, you know, she, she did a really good job. She, you know, took notes really well, which is super important. But then there were missing chunks of, of chapters and, things were coming in out of order and it ended up two months past the due date and I have still didn't have an audiobook. Um, errors that I pointed out a month prior still weren't fixed. And I was contacting the narrator directly and she was very frustrated because she's like, I've sent the production company all the stuff and they're not putting it up, but I didn't have a way to contact them. So I ended up telling her, look, I'm really sorry, but I, I need to end this contract with you, which you can do. I mean, as if, if things like what, what happened do, do happen to you, you as the author can end the contract with the narrator. So we parted ways. I have no ill will towards this woman or anything like that. Um, it sounds like she was kind of in the, the same frustrating boat I was. And I started all over again. Uh, but this time I did decide to um, 
do like about $300 or so upfront. Like I had a little tiny bit of a nest egg. So that actually brought me to the attention of, or brought some higher quality narrators into my circle or into my orbit rather. Um, and it took, a, it took almost two months to find another narrator that I liked. And this time I was super picky. I was like, I knew what I wanted. I knew what to avoid this time around. Um, and I had gotten some great advice from other authors that had an audiobook out. Like what is some red flags that, you know, I need to look out for. Um, and I found my narrator, Jill Crenshaw, and uh, she was great. And she has this spectacular, like Kathleen Turner-esque, husky beautiful female voice that I'm just in love with um and she got the emotion of the characters um she understood that I didn't want male versus female voices while still being able to um differentiate the characters just enough to where you're not lost when you're listening to it um and I just I I loved working with her and so she's actually producing uh the second book in that trilogy right now and then I have another uh, series but with a black female protagonist. And so it was really important to me to look for a black woman or a person of at least mixed heritage to, to narrate that. And I was like, you know, this is gonna be a long process. So I kind of buckled in for it taking a while and it did, um, but I did end up finding a really good narrator for that. And so that's also in production at the moment. So I think it's just, you gotta be patient, you gotta, you got to understand what you do and you don't want. Don't just be like, well, it's good enough. No, don't do that. You will regret it. Like hold out for what you are looking for. Don't be in such a rush. And that was my problem the first time around. I was just in a rush. I wanted to get it done. Um, I don't do that anymore because it costs me time and frustration and I just, I don't have the bandwidth. So I would say the most important thing is patience. <laughs> It's 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 ironic, but it, but true. I mean, I I've had some of my own experiences with ACX as well. Um, certainly with that, with the royalty share, and I, I kind of I with with I'm getting my first zombie apocalypse fiction book produced, and so I did nice. fork out some money up front, you know, for yeah. that. But I kind of held it from the perspective of I have to see a certain amount of sales as well to justify mm -hmm. this, because I know because if I know there's an audience there then that's gonna make it easier to justify that cost. But also having experienced some cases where people flaked on me, where, you know, it was a royalty share and it's like, well, I can't, I can't do that. And there's a, there's a saying uh, that, that I've heard sometimes where it's like, you know, uh, this guy, he's on the way, he's on, it's during the, it's uh, the minister tally ran and he's on the way in the French revolution, you know, he's on this way to this meeting. If he doesn't show up on there, there on time, he's gonna, you know, get his head chopped off. and. And the coach driver is, is, you know, going as fast as he can and the wheels start to go off the carriage and he says to the guy, slow down to hurry up, which sounds ah. ironic and weird. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is like, you do have to be patient. You can't yeah. hurry that process through. And I think a lot of times authors, you know, they're, they love their work. They want to get it out there, but there's always that thing like where it's like, you can either do it quick and, 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 you know, without quality, or you can do it with quality and have the right thing. So I think you made the right decision there. And, and so often, I mean, I, I, I've been in that boat too. I think it's really important to recognize that it's kind of why I'm waiting on my superhero fiction for the moment until I do the audio books for it, for that reason. Yeah. You gotta, yeah. Patience. It's hard. <laughs> we see everybody else doing it. And I did, uh, uh, Jeremy flag, he's got all these audio books. I'm like, man, I want that. And he's like, just wait, you know, just wait, it's going to happen. Just wait, you know, and um, I'm glad I did. I'm, I'm glad I did because Jill is amazing. And Elise, my other narrator, she's just, I couldn't have asked for two more perfect women to read my book, honestly. Yeah. And in my case, I actually had the guy contact me for the zombie apocalypse fiction book because he'd picked up, he'd picked it up and, and oh, like, fun. I could tell like his, you know, I interviewed him and I'm like, okay. Cause I was like, I was going to hold off for a while. And then I'm like, all right, his knowledge of the industry tells me he's the right fit. So that's yeah. why I'll go with it. And I think, you know, it is worth waiting and not necessarily jumping the gun on that. And of course, just continuing to produce that quality writing that, that you want to produce, mm -hmm. that's going to make it, make your stuff stand out. Yep. So one of the other things that I that I noticed is like you you originally had different covers with mm -hmm. your fiction. So what was that process like and why did you end up changing those covers? 
So I'm actually on my third set of covers. <laughs> um, my so originally, like as many indie authors, I had no money, and I was researching covers before I published, and looking at Fiverr and looking at cover artists, and realizing, oh my God, I don't have you know three hundred dollars to drop on one cover. So I have a really good friend that's been in the publishing industry for over 20 years now. Um, and he's, he does a lot of design work. It's that was actually his first love. And he designs all of his covers. He um, designs the art for all of the his original RPG manuals. I mean, he's, he's an incredible artist. So I asked him, I said, how much would you charge me to do my book covers? He's like, Oh, my God, I would do it for free. Let's talk. So we did and his original designs were gorgeous. They were beautiful. They were moody. Um, they were, oh, they were very comic book art like, but they weren't good book covers. And they were beautiful pieces of art. In fact, I have one blown up in my front room as like this big poster. Gorgeous pieces of art, not good book covers. And I think that's, as a newbie, I did all the research I could. I, I collected all the knowledge I could, but there's always going to be some things that you're not going to know until you get in the thick of it. And this was one of it for me. Um, I love the covers. I thought they were great. But when they were up on Amazon, you know, we, we were taught to look at the thumbnail because, you know, or the smaller version, because that's what most people are going to see. And they were they were too dark. They didn't pop. Um, the hard part with superhero fiction, honestly, is there is no industry standard of book covers. You know, you look at an urban fantasy cover and you know what an urban fantasy cover is at all. They all have the same elements. But with superhero fiction, there's a lot of variance. Um, one of them, the, maybe one of the only things is an obvious sign that these are supers, whether it's a mask or a display of powers. But other than that, you really don't have a standard. So I did what research I could and I put those up and I realized about a year and a half later that, you know what, these aren't working. I know they're not working. And I had done a little bit more research and realized I needed to pivot towards more of an urban fantasy, like emphasizing the urban fantasy part of the book as a way to market it. So I asked him, I said, you know, this is what we, my, my original cover artist, my friend, I said, this is what I need. I need people on the cover. And he's like, Ooh, I don't really do good book cover people, but we can try. And so we did and it didn't work. <laughs> um, he, you know, he's, he was really sweet about it. And he's like, I don't think these are going to work for you. And we tested them and it was a, probably a year later that I was like, yeah, these aren't working. I'm, I know that this isn't what we need. And so we, we parted ways amicably. I mean, he's one of my best friends. So there was no, love, you know, no problem there. And I ended up starting over and uh, doing some research on designers asking. I had a lot more author friends now. So I could ask like a broad range of people like, who did your covers? And so somebody recommended Pixie covers to me um, as someone that she's an author herself and she just kind of does this on the side. So she doesn't charge a whole lot and she gave series discounts and I thought okay let's try this so I went and I hunted for um I went and I looked at the urban fantasy genre and I said okay what are the top selling book covers what do they look like how is that going to translate to uh superheroes what are the elements I need to emphasize and so I collected probably 20 images and I looked at them and I conversed with the cover designer back and forth. And I said, this is what I've had. This is what I don't want. This is what I'm nervous about because she did face swapping with Daz models. And if nobody knows what that means, basically it's a digitally rendered body with a, with a photographic face over it. And all I could imagine was like it looking so weird and terrible. So she's <laughs> like, no, like, you know, like somebody saying, oh my God, you know, it's like a horror film. Somebody like peeled a face off and stuck it on another body kind of a thing. But she sent me some examples of what she had done in her portfolio. And I thought, okay. And I told her, I said, I like these examples in the portfolio you sent me. I said, if we could hit the cover, make it look similar to these, then I think we can work together. And that's, and that's the other thing. It was funny. I, I also learned to be honest, that it's a business relationship. Like it was really hard to do that with a friend, even though he told me, this is a business relationship. I've had a really hard time doing that. 
but I learned that lesson. Again, I made those mistakes. I learned that lesson so that when I went to with a different cover designer, I was really able to emo emotionally stand back, which is what you need when you're wearing your business hat. You're not the author anymore. You're the business owner. And you have to look at something like a book cover from a business standpoint. Is this the best thing to market my book? Um, and to be honest, you know, the people on the cover, they don't look exactly like the way they're, they're described. Their outfits are not exactly um, the super suits that they wear in the book. In fact, one of them in particular is the exact opposite. But you know what? It works from a marketing standpoint and nobody has griped about it since I changed those covers. And so, I'm sorry, this is a little bit rambling, but um, I really wanted to emphasize that, that, you know, you have to stand back emotionally um, when you're when you're looking at something like a like a book cover and really go for what's going to sell your book. And if the cover designer you're working with isn't willing to hear that feedback, then you have a problem. Then you might need to part ways. But Pixie Covers, the woman that, that runs Pixie Covers, she was really great. We had a lot of back and forth, really positive experience. Um, when I didn't like something, she would tweak it. Um, and she did my eBooks, my print and my audiobook covers and gave me a series discount. And it was, I, I will work with her and also a cover villain who's doing my romance covers coming up. Um, I will work with the two of them for the rest of my career if I can, because they're just, they both listen, they both take feedback and it's not personal, it's business for all involved. And that is really key. So yeah. Yeah, it is absolutely key. And, and I think it's interesting because, I mean, you, you know, you're right about the superhero covers because, and, and I think you kind of have the added risk of, of comic books, yeah. superhero comic books. So, you know, you kind of have the thing of, you know, if you go too comic booky of a, of a cover, people are like, oh, it's a graphic novel. That's not, that's not the superhero fiction I want or yeah. vice versa. And, and so that can always be an interesting challenge in of itself when you have a particular genre. I like the way that you 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 describe kind of like that research process, though, because it's so essential. And yet we don't you don't learn that out the gate. You, yeah. you kind of have to go through a couple iterations and you have to be willing to let go of some of those covers sometimes and, and start over again, even though it's mm -hmm. not quite what you hoped it would be initially. So I think that that's uh, really important. And it, it, it's absolutely true. I mean, there is a business relationship. Your cover artists, uh, the cover artists that I work with, it's the same thing. It's like, you know, I, I like him as a person. He's awesome, mm -hmm. but I'm still going to give him feedback. There's been a couple of times where I had covers that were like completely like, no, that's not going to work at all. We got to start over. Yeah. And as author, I mean, when I'm, when, as authors, you know, we're the ones forking out the money. So it's kind of like, you know what, if I'm going to be giving you money for this, I have to insist on a mm -hmm. certain standard. And I have to be able to advocate for myself because the cover designer isn't going to necessarily know that, uh, you know, uh, so it's important to, to remember that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, one of the other things that's really stood out to me about your work is actually how you've coordinated um, superhero fiction in general. You have a superhero oh. fiction website and you also have a couple of superhero fiction uh, Facebook groups, one for authors and one for readers. I'm a member of the Superhero Fiction Author Group, and it's a great it's a great resource. I mean, I've gotten a lot out of there, you know, following some of the conversations. So I just want to thank you for that, and also the Superhero You're Fiction welcome. site. Uh, you know, how what was your involvement in each of those sites? Because I know you're one of the co-moderators, and you've done it looks like you've done a fair amount of work there. So. Um... It, it's a little bit of a weird winding road, honestly. So Jeremy Flagg and I met um, because we, uh, I wanted to do a box set of superhero novels. We, were, we, we met in a different Facebook group, the Indie Superhero Author Facebook group. And I wanted to do a box set and um, we had chatted online and he was like, oh, I, I wanna do a box set too. Do you wanna do it with me? And I was like, sure, let's do it together. And that was kind of, that was exactly how our relationship started. And in collaborating and getting that together, we became really good friends. And we live at opposite ends of the country. So this is all virtually. And we both decided, I think it was in 2018, to go to 20 Books to 50K in Chicago. And um, 
we went, we met face to, you know, like in real life for the first time. And it was there that it, we had been chatting a little bit about how there really needs to be a better way to kind of take back our genre. Because when you look on the Amazon, like superhero fiction top 100, you're very lucky if you find like three actual superhero books in that list. And we had been cheesed off about this for months, right? We were just like, there has to be a way to fix this. And we both decided, okay, let's brainstorm some ideas and let's talk when we get to Chicago. So we got to Chicago and there had already been a superhero fiction website but um, put together by Perry Constantine, but Perry wasn't really doing a whole lot with it. I think it was Perry that put it together, if, if I remember correctly, or maybe it was Remy that did it with Perry. I don't remember the exactness of it, but anyway, Perry I, was involved originally in it. And so what we decided was, let's take that website and let's make it a discoverability vehicle for the genre. And we, we kind of got really inspired by the lit RPG genre because honestly, those authors all banded together and they had they figured out the standard of what makes a lit RPG book. And they put that out there and they put it up on websites and they put it up in Facebook groups. And Remy and I both agreed that if we as authors didn't take control and define what our genre was, we would continue to be run over by urban fantasy and paranormal genres. That we had to kind of take the reins of that like the lit RPG people. And one of the best ways to do that was to have a website that people could point to and say, here's all the superhero fiction that we can find. Um, and not make it a store. We are not a storefront. We are a discoverability website with yeah. links to the storefronts. That's super important for people in Kindle Unlimited. <laughs> Well, that's and that's very clear to me. I mean, but I but I think that's good. That you make that you you note that. I mean, I, I when I started um, finally started to decide to write fiction. I've I've written nonfiction for a long time. I've been writing since like and publishing books since like two thousand three. So, but it was the uh, but fiction I had held off on for a long time. And when I wrote my first book, fiction book, learning how to fly which literally took me 20 years to write. <laughs> Thankfully, it hasn't taken that long since then with any of my other fiction. But um, I, I remember I was like, all right, I'm going to do a Google search. And the first site that popped up was the superhero fiction site. And I was like, oh, cool. thank the heavens. It was like, I found a site. I can look at this. This gives me some ideas. And, and I, can, I can connect with these people that have mm -hmm. the same passion. And I can share this what I'm doing. And, and, and I loved it because of the fact that, you know, when you look for a lot of genres out there, you don't necessarily find genre specific sites like that. Like yeah. I haven't found anything for zombie apocalypse fiction along those lines. And I've looked and, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to put my time and effort into creating a website like that. I mean, I appreciate the work. I mean, I will give you guys respect you know, through the wazoo for doing that. But I mean, I, cause I know that's a work of passion and love right there, but it is, it's, it's also one of those things where it's kind of like, you, you know, that's where you appreciate the people who are willing to do that and kind of create that, that community. And I, and yeah. so I, I thank you both You're very welcome. for that because it's so nice. And I, I really like the superhero readers and, and fiction uh, or superhero authors, uh, Facebook groups as well, for precisely that reason. It's nice to be able to network with fellow mm -hmm. authors about the genre that you're writing in. Yeah, and we wanted, so the indie superhero author Facebook group was very broad, and which is great. Like if, if you're just starting out and you haven't published anything and you just want a place to go to like, just talk about superhero fiction, it's a great spot. But Remy and I wanted a more narrowed focus. So that's why we created, the superhero fiction author group and really have made it specific that you know you have to be either like already published or you have a pre-order up or some you know you're some way in that very professional vein because we wanted it laser focused um also to just kind of help each other you know that rising tide mentality and to create that community of authors that would promote one another's books um and uh, you know those that are further down the road helping out those that were just starting with like some advice and wisdom about how to market superhero fiction in particular because it's it's unlike any other genre honestly and it is actually very hard to market so 
how you know the ones that are making those lists um and that are doing really well how did they do that and so um we've been you know really wanting really putting in a lot of work to build that community but also how do we bring more discoverability like we that was really our focus this year was um because between you know last year our growth numbers they were okay but they weren't great and so we were like okay how can we grow this how can we get more eyeballs on the website what do we need to do and so that's why we started uh the podcast network with geekorama and behind the mask that's why we did the virtual convention which we are planning on doing again next year even bigger if we can pull it off <laughs> um, um we got our video series you know we do the promotions we do the anthologies like we're just we're trying to to get it, you know, going as much as possible. And it's, it is a lot of work. Um, and Remy and I tend to, hey, let's do this. And then we get in the thick of it and we're like, oh my God, what were we thinking? <laughs> um, but we also, the great part about it though, is in building a community, we have people that volunteer to come alongside us. And so Krista, um, who's one of our romance authors, she does a lot of the content now for the page, um, for the author group um we have franklin kendrick who does the behind the mask podcast so we have people that have been starting to volunteer and ask us how can we help and that's fantastic i lovingly call them our minions because they are they, we couldn't do this we couldn't take over the world without them um but yeah we had a very clear vision when we started the website this is what we want to do and we really try have tried to stick with that that everything we do brings it back to discoverability. That is our main driving goal, so. Yeah, and we did the the, the Black Friday sale. I mean, I think that yeah. went really well again this year. I, I participated in last year as well. And then of course the virtual convention, which I'm gonna come back to um, because that was, that was fascinating. I, I think one thing that I really took from what you just said though, is you know, the importance of building a team. Like yeah. you don't have to do this all on your own. You know, of course you've got Remy that you're working with, and, and sometime I'll have to have the two of you back on just for <laughs> just to do like a, a you know, a, a, an interview with both of you about that, but also, um, you know, having other people step up and participate mm -hmm. or show up in some form is just as important because it, it really does, does matter so that, you know, as you said, you know, you have that rising tide of people, yep. you know, the rising boats. I think that's really important <clears throat> as well. So let's talk a bit about the virtual conference. I got to participate in that as well. I, I remember that we had all actually been in another virtual conference, or at least some of us have been in another virtual conference that kind of yeah. prompted that. What were some of the mm -hmm. challenges and, uh, and and things that you you had with putting on a, a virtual conference that was just focused on superhero fiction? Um, well, we'd never done it before. Um, and we actually put it together rather quickly. Um, we kept it simple because it was one of those things that we put together and I think about three weeks, which is just insane. Um, we kept it super simple. Um, one of the biggest challenges was, okay, what do we want to do? We want to use Zoom, we want to use StreamYard, like how are we exactly going to do this? And we ended up, I believe that's when we started using StreamYard um, because it was so simple um, to, to be able to live stream it to YouTube um, while we were going on. Um, we we actually we thought we'd have a little bit of a challenge finding panelists and moderators but we really didn't and we didn't have anybody flake i mean we we were running down the list of things that could go horribly wrong and how we were going to handle it so we had some contingencies in place but um yeah we didn't have to use any of our backups um in terms of moderators or panelists that i remember and there might have been one panelist that came down with a migraine and so we pulled in uh, somebody for that. But I mean, really, that was it. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges was just getting the word out. I mean, we, we put it together so quickly, we didn't really have any lead time to advertise. Um, but we did end up having like we, we were Remy and I were going over the end of the year numbers for for everything. And there's a noticeable spike um when we did that convention across all of our platforms so the word did get out you know again it got discoverability back to the website it got discoverability on our authors and their work and so it, it achieved the goal for which it was intended um, which was great and so we really want to do another one in june 
Um, and it's specifically a superhero convention. And we had talked about expanding it. Let's do sci-fi. Let's do this, that. And we're like, no, let's keep it really narrowly focused because we're superhero fiction. We, you know, so let's stay with that. Um, the challenge with what we want to do is that it's like not twice as big. It's like three times as much as what we had done. So that's going to take a lot of planning. Um, and we've started that already and, and just making a list of our resources. Who do we know? Who do we know that is a big enough name that just having them there would get attention? Um, who do we know that can do this? Who do we know that can do that? Um, it, it's a lot, the, 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 the planning part is my favorite, um, even though we do get in the weeds a little bit. And I think the challenge really is gonna be nailing all of it down and managing it from a, from a time management perspective. And that was challenging with the smaller version of it where we just did one a night um in terms of like managing a time with putting it together and making sure it went smoothly and our own author businesses and then our personal lives so um i hope that answered your question i feel like i went really like around and around i'm just super excited about it um no i because... think that did i mean i'm i'm learning about <laughs> virtual summits myself right now i'm actually taking a course called uh, virtual summit mastery uh oh wow that's exciting uh, yeah, because I'm I'm interested in in uh, in doing a couple different things with it, so I'm I'm just kind of working my way through it slowly, and so it's always interesting to hear like what other people are doing and how they did mm -hmm. it, and uh, I think you know a lot of times it it really boils down to those kinds of things. So I think that's great. I mean, I I know I enjoy being part of the superhero fiction um, summit. I thought it was great, and and I loved sharing this stuff out there with my my list and group of people so i think you know when you have something like that and especially when the 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 participants in whatever form they're there are mm -hmm. you know are you know helping out and connecting it, it makes a huge difference and of course it's something that people love learning about so i think that's yeah. that's awesome so um you, you kind of got me to my last question, which is, you know, you, you, of course, you've got the superhero fiction stuff going on, then you're a writer. And then of course, you've, you're, you're a mom and whatever yeah. else going on. So, you know, what tips or suggestions do you have to those of us watching who, uh, in, in terms of balancing your life a bit around your passions of writing and taking care of the home life and stuff like that? Because of course, you can't run a business, a successful business without having some kind of support network in place at home. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's, 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 it is the greatest question. It's, it's the question. Um, when I first started this, I scoured <clears throat> the internet and Facebook for advice on how to do this. Um, and everybody's got a different answer because everybody's got different kinds of kids. Um, I have two kids, like my, my oldest daughter has ADD and, um, my youngest daughter, has um, her own set of challenges and they're both really high energy. They're both very extroverted. Um, and I'll be honest, it was challenging when they were, when they would go to physical school, like a physical school building, but at least I had like the day. Um, having them at home reminds me about why I never even considered homeschooling um, because I am not built for that. Um, but throughout the whole thing, from day one, when I decided to do this, I was very honest with my girls. And um, I told them, I said, mommy is going to be an author and have her own business. And it means that mommy needs to work. Mommy's going to need some work hours here at home. And they've been excited and supportive. And they, they're disappointed sometimes when I shut my office door and, you know, mommy's got a deadline and I, I'm really sorry, but I can't play with you right now can I play with you tomorrow? Can I play with you after dinner? You know, I always try to give them another option to let them know that I love them. I think that's one of the biggest things as moms in particular, we have this huge guilt button. And when we have to tell our kids no, um, we feel like we're not being good moms, but it's important to have a boundary. It's important to say to yourself, I will play with them, but I do have to get this done. Because honestly, for me, it, I've learned that when I've got that deadline and I give into the guilt, I'm like, okay, let's go do this. I'm not present with them. I'm, I'm thinking about the work that's not getting done. So I've learned if there's a deadline and I've really got to get something done, 
I need to do that first as much as I can, you know, until four o'clock or wherever. And then I can go play with them without having that hanging over my head. So for me, that that's been a very hard one lesson is accepting that having boundaries actually makes me a good mom, not a bad mom. <laughs> um, also, my husband was very supportive from the beginning. Um, he was supportive of my first NaNoWriMo, which is how I, I got started. Um, and when I told him I wanted to be an indie author, he was supportive of that too. Um, his only question was, how are you, how are you going to do this? What's the, what are you looking at for time that you need, you know, and, and those kind of logistical questions. And I think I, I kind of lucked out because he and I started off our married life as independent artists. Anyway, we met in acting school. We were actors. We had a production company with a friend. Um, so we understood, we, we both understood that being independent artists is a risky proposition. And the main piece of it is marketing. And I learned that the hard way with our production company. Um, so that was one of his main questions was, how are you going to market it? And I said, I have no idea, but I'm going to learn. Um, and we just kind of went from there. And when I need time to write at night, I'd let him know. Um, when I need him to cook dinners, he does. I mean, we just, we, we divide the work. And I think having a supportive partner, um, however that needs to look like, that is key. You know, if your partner is begrudging you work time, if your partner isn't willing to, to take leave with the kids or dinner or dishes or whatever, so that you can get some work done, that's going to be a pressure point that it's going to cause lots of issues. Um, so having that supportive partner, being honest with your children and having those boundaries and, and then being okay with that, telling yourself, this is okay. It's okay for me to have a career. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but then also recognizing, hey, you know what? I've been working a lot of hours this week. Maybe I need to take some time. And there's also that as well. So it's it's hard to find that balance. Like, I think for me, oftentimes I don't realize I'm out of balance until one of the kids says, you've been working every night this week. You haven't played with me this week. And I'm like, oh yeah, you know, you're right. You ha I haven't. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's trial and error. Like I've been doing this for several years now and every year I learn something new. Every year it's like, oh, okay, this actually works or this doesn't work. Um, I also carve out time for myself in the morning to meditate and just spend some quiet time with myself and meditation. Um, and that tends to help balance me throughout the day. I'll, I'll take little meditation breaks of a couple of minutes if I need it recenter, remind myself why I'm doing this, remind myself what my priorities are. Um, and those things have been lifesavers, especially this year. <laughs> I'll second that. I meditate as well every day. And oh yeah. boy, what a difference it makes. It, it yeah. really does. I mean, I, I, I totally get that. I, I second that. Yeah. Did that answer your, I never, I never know quite how to answer it because it's, it feels nebulous in a way like it answered my <laughs> yeah it answered my question i mean i i think okay, it's yeah. great i i like I, I mean i think those are some good i mean i mean you make a great point you know it's it's differing circumstances i mean i know for myself you know i've got you, you know i i definitely there, there are times where i'm definitely out there helping out with the cooking and stuff because my my wife works a pretty demanding job Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's other times where she's like, why don't you write for a little while longer tonight while I'm taking care of this? You know, there is that give and take and there's, yeah. there's all those other things. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's just a simple fact of life. And, and, you know, you, you're right, you know, you kind of figure it out depending on what the circumstances are mm -hmm. and, and then go from there. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you again, Trish, for coming on to the show. It's really great to have you here. And for those of you who are watching, um, if you go ahead and click on the subscribe button below and click on the little bell notification, you'll get notification of other great videos like this uh, uh, for both the podcast and also the regular videos that I do. And check out the show notes where you can go and check out Trisha's website as well as the uh, author fiction, super, superhero author fiction website. And uh, I will definitely have to have you and Jeremy on uh, sometime just to kind of talk about what that teamwork looks like and also just get him on yep. at some point as well. 
Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting dynamic. Honestly, we balance each other out surprisingly well. I have to say, <laughs> thank you for having me. This has been a really nice conversation. Thank you.